-hmm. I am so excited excited that we were able to uh, gather together uh, via computer for this beautiful conversation. Um, so in terms of what we're going to do for the next 90 minutes, uh, there's a number of us uh, who are participating. Um, there's actually a few people who might be joining us a little later in the call. I see Take Back Our Streets has joined us. Awesome. Okay. My name is Claudia Alec, and I'm the executive director of uh, Calling Up which is a transmedia social justice company that is producing performances of social justice around the country. Um, and I was traveling around the country and met with Viju Singh, who's this brilliant director who had <laughs> directed an Every 28 Hours Plays engagement that was also a collaboration with the protest plays. And we were sitting there having this beautiful one-on-one -on -one exchange and she had the great idea of, oh, we should figure out how to share what we're talking about with others. So she thought, well, let's get, she's artist in residence at Brava. Brava offered a space. We thought, let's do it there. It'll have a few of us in the room. And then we kept talking about it and thought, you know what? We keep talking to ourselves in these small rooms. How do we make sure other people get to access this information? How do we make sure that we're not repeating ourselves over and over and over again in small rooms full of the people doing the work? So then we thought, well, let's live stream this bad boy. And then we realized if we really want to include the national constituency of people who have been collaborating on this work, we should just be completely digital. So we are all participating from our different areas of the world. Um, so that's me just giving a quick frame of how we came to be and, and what we're doing on this call. Um, uh, we would love to have people quickly introduce themselves. In terms of um, doing a digital uh, discussion, um, it's best to have yourself muted if you're not actively speaking. That way we can cut down on background noise. And um, if you could give us your name, uh, your organization, your gender pronouns, and, uh, and I like to do an access check-in when I have conversations with, uh, with people that I haven't spoken to before. So my access check-in is, uh, you might notice that I have some twitchiness or weird body language. That's not me reacting to anything that you are saying, that's me reacting mm -hmm. to my own body giving me pains. Um, um, but other than that, my accessibility is great. Also, feel free to take advantage of the chat functions if you're participating in the conversation via Zoom. And if you are watching live via Facebook or HowlRound, yay, HowlRound, um, please feel free to uh, post questions there and we will try and integrate those into our conversation as we can. All right, so I'm going to mute myself. Hand the mic over to Vitu so she can introduce herself and then allow uh, the rest of our awesome participants to introduce themselves. Hi, uh, thank you, Claudia. Uh, my name is Vidhu, and uh, uh, I'm Vidhu Singh. I'm a theater director. I'm a recovering academic. Uh, I'm a uh, artist in residence at Brava Theater. And I, uh, in April, uh, we presented an event called Books and Bullets at Brava, which included every 28 hours plays. Um, and uh, that's it, that's a brief introduction. Uh, I'll uh, move on and perhaps Carla, who is part of that event can introduce herself. Uh, I do apologize, my name here, name is Vidhu Singh, uh, but it shows as my hot mom Gandhi, which is the name of my friend's film, but I love the name, it's fine. So. Um, and, uh, and just for consistency, can you give us uh, your preferred gender pronouns? And, and if you feel like this, everything's accessible for you, just say my access needs are met. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. Uh, she works for me. Uh, yeah, actually I did, didn't wanna add that because Claudia and I had been emailing uh, and then, then I heard that you were gonna be in the Bay Area and we decided to meet and it's really, uh, it was really fantastic to meet you Claudia in person. And uh, yeah, we had a lovely time. We met at the Ferry Building. We had fantastic conversation, which has led to this <laughs> event, so. Carla, you want to? All right. 
Uh, my name is Carla. I go by she as well. <clears throat> I have been a part of the Brava Theater for about six or seven years, and so they have been such a wonderful support group for me. And I'm so happy to be continuing with them and, and continuing to work on shows with you do. Uh, I'm a set designer and a theater artist, and I work also more recently in soundscape ecology, which is going out and recording uh, natural ecosystems. So that's a whole other world that's opened up to me. Um, so what I'm trying to do primarily is uh, work in environmental justice through healing our relationship with nature and allowing everyone to realize that that uh, there are a lot of options for sustainable living practices out there and um, <clears throat> just for, you know bring us all into the conversation because whether it's an urban or a rural rural space there is a lot of work to be done and i i'm hoping to to bring a more uh, ecological viewpoint um, uh, to that so that's where i'm at now Um, so I, I wanted to add that Carla actually backpacks all around Patagonia by herself. Uh, and she also goes to the Amazon and she records insects and sounds. And so she, she really works around um, uh, climate and uh, environment and also social justice. So and she's a fantastic designer. Uh, Stephanie, you want to go next? Yeah. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Stephanie Wilborn. First of all, it's such an honor to be part of this conversation. So thank you for having me here, Claudia. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and hers. And my ex access needs are met right now. So thank you for asking, Claudia. I think that's really important we ask that. Um, I am currently the community coordinator here at American Conservatory Theater, ACT in San Francisco. And what that kind of looks like, even though I do a lot of community outreach, or I should say community social justice work, primarily with low income uh, communities, people of color, and things of that nature. I'm also a theater educator. I go to a lot of high schools around in the Bay Area and teach, and also a lot of boys and girls clubs as well. Uh, this past February at ACT, um, I produced a, a every 20 hours, but making it more of a festival and really focusing on black arts healing. So what that looked like, there was a lot of visual art as well as the plays that we produce. A lot of uh, workshops that actually talked about the issues around every 28 hours. And uh, it just focusing on how do we as people of color use our platforms that we have today and really, really touch on the issues that affect our communities, such police brutality, gun reform issues, all of these things, and how do we keep this, these conversations and this momentum going to propel us further into the future and part of these conversations. So yeah, thank you so much. And I think the last person that hasn't introduced himself is Tiffany, is that right? Yeah, so go right ahead. Hi, um, I'm Tiffany with Protest Place Project. I, I had the distinct pleasure of speaking with Claudia, um, gosh, I guess a couple months ago about our theater action um, gun control play initiative that we had started. Um, through that, I, I was so happy I got to speak with um, Carrie Dodge Speaks and, and, um, and Claudia about the, the uh, every 28 hour plays. And then we also had um, uh, from, from Carrie Dodge a collection of the um, uh, 28, or 28 gun plays and um, after Orlando plays. And we um, put together a collection of uh, plays from new play companies from playwrights who were willing to let their plays be produced below PC for um, uh, theater action gun control events. So we wound up having um, a little over 20 um, uh, readings across the nation in March and April. Most of them were in March. We had a few in April. And it was just, it was just really heartening to see so many, um, so many theater makers who, who maybe didn't have access to playwrights or maybe hadn't heard of these collections yet um, or hadn't gotten involved with these collections yet. To um, to have readings and and raise money for Moms in Action and um, and every turn and so um, uh, and right now we're working on a new initiative. It's a Get Out the Vote Plays initiative. I'm sorry, this is my son Finnegan. He's feeling a little clingy at the moment. <laughs> well, hopefully he'll behave. Um, and um, um, and so now we're doing a Get Out the Vote initiative um, because. Um, you know, of course, none of this means anything if nobody actually votes or, or shows up and, and, and takes action and joins joins causes. And so we're really big on 
trying to connect with community organizations and trying to activate audiences. Um, and so that's kind of what, what we've been doing um, recently. And um, very, very looking, much looking forward to being here. I'm sorry, and I, I'm she, her is, is my are my identifiers, and um, I don't have any access um, problems today, so thank you very much. And um, uh, let's see, who else has not been? I see a Kathy and Lauren were up there. Yeah, okay, thank you. That's great. Uh, Lauren, do you wanna uh, do a quick introduction of yourself? Sure, hi, thanks uh, for having me. Um, I am a playwright and I go by she, her, hers. My access needs are met. Um, so I'm here because, um, <clears throat> I'm just gonna cough into everybody's <laughs> uh, face for the, my introduction. Um, so I, I'm a writer and um, right after Parkland happened, um, I happened to be working on a one woman play called Natural Shocks, which is uh, a play that deals with a lot of things, including um, gun violence, violence against women. Um, and yet it is a 60 minute comedy. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and so right after that happened, um, a producer and a friend of mine who I've known for a decade, um, decided to work with me to make sure that the play got out um, all across the U.S. We were aiming for 50 states. I think we got 46. So on April 20th, which was the 19th anniversary of Columbine this year, um, the play was produced, uh, was given away royalty-free um, to anyone who wanted to do a reading um, that would be a fundraiser for Moms Demand Action or Everytown or local uh, domestic abuse and domestic survivor um, organizations. And so we had about 107 readings um, in that weekend of this play, all raising wow. anywhere from $100 to a couple thousand dollars at each event. Um, and there was a, a big reading um, in New York, which raised several thousand dollars starring the actress Catherine Jimmy. Um, and so we, we, we really did turned um, a play uh, that was just a one woman speaking into um, a, a way to talk about guns, a way to talk about masculine violence in relation to women and um, women's violence. And uh, so, yeah, it's that's that's was such a confirming and incredible thing to be a part of. So it, it seems like a lot of us have similar ideas about being present in the community, using art to say things that newspapers and statistics can't. Um, so that's why I'm, I'm so excited about the work that everybody's doing and, um, and quite, uh, it's quite a confirmation that, that we're, we're doing something um, important, valuable, urgent, and putting art and activism into the same space, which is, which is amazing. Uh, I'm also super excited, this is Claudia again, I'm super excited that we have not only um, artists who work in performance, but we also have artists that are working in visual arts and craft arts. Um, so we have uh, Sarah Trail on the call, as well as Kathy DeForest. Kathy DeForest is representing Vision Quilt, and Kathy introduced me to Sarah quite recently, and I'm super excited about her work as well. So um, Kathy, would you please introduce yourself? Yes. Now, how do I do that? Do I need, <laughs> do you see me or mm -hmm. do I need to push a button? You can see me? Yes. You're okay. All right. So I am uh, Kathy DeForest, identify as she, her, her. And I started Vision Quilt about two and a half years ago. It was inspired by the AIDS quilt, which moved our country from fear to connection. And 54 tons of AIDS quilts have been made since 1984. So that's our goal. 54 tons of vision quilt panels. <laughs> and I can show you some panels uh, when I get that opportunity. But we've been working primarily in Southern Oregon. That's where we started, but I used to live in the Bay Area. So we've also working in Oakland and in Chicago. So we have, we primarily work with kids in middle school and high school, but we've had people as young as 14 months and as old as 96 years old making panels. And these are, we've asked people to share their visions on how to prevent gun violence. We've had exhibitions in universities, museums. Claudia hosted us with about 80 panels at MLK Day. She also brought us in at OSF, um, the 28 hour plays uh, where we held, hung them in the Bomer Theater. We've been working with uh, tomorrow night, if any of you are in the Bay Area um, and not watching the Warriors play off, um, 65 middle school students from the Oakland Charter School um, have made vision quilt panels and they're having a, an amazing exhibition um, right down in downtown Oakland. Um, we're also in a museum show that Sarah and I 
are connected to at in San Jose, and that show is called Guns Loaded. Um, loaded conversations and our video of the kids in Oakland are being showcased there and that will be up until July 15th in San Jose. But we've also been working in Chicago and our, we, we are very decentralized. We work primarily on volunteers, but through one phone conversation, a woman at the National Veterans Art Museum in Chicago had 65 young people and families one summer make vision quilt panels and there was a huge exhibition at that museum and we have a hospital there that a children's hospital that hopefully is going to become our partner we've been working with violence uh, prevention organizations in oakland and public health institutions we will partner with anyone um, we really we, we tell everyone the vision quilt panels are really sharing people's vision. And we've worked with gun owners from the beginning. They've been part of our process. And it's about using the power of art and inclusive dialogue. And these are permanent um, panels. So those of you that are working with moms or every town or other organizations, you know, we let people borrow them. People use them for the June 2nd event, the Wear Orange event. Um, We've used them, we've been to Washington, D.C. with them. We use them in vigils and marches, and we work a lot with survivors. And the kids in, in Chicago are phenomenal. Um, we were there with Father Flager at St. Sabina's, the community center next to that. So that's a, that's a quick view of us, but we would love, our ideal is that when there's an exhibition, there is music, performance, um, spoken word, and then we have community conversations about what that neighborhood or that community can do in the next six months related to preventing gun violence. And our theme, I don't know if you can see my shirt, is together we can prevent gun violence. Thank you, Claudia and everyone. <clears throat> Um, uh, Joan, do you want to do a quick introduction of yourself? I'm still in the midst of trying to pull up some video for Sarah. Um, I might fail and I might simply share your website, Sarah. But Joan, please talk to us. Are you in St. Louis right now? At the moment I am, yes. Hi. <laughs> I never know where I am. Hi, everybody. I am so thrilled to be part of this conversation. And I want to thank uh, Vinju and, and Claudia for convening us. So. Um, my name's Joan Lipkin. I'm the producing artistic director of that uppity theater company, which is based in St. Louis. And I met Claudia when we worked together on every 28 hours when they came to St. Louis uh, to sort of use it as, as the incubator for developing every 28 hours, which so many of us have been involved with. Um, in terms of the work that my company does, we work on many, many issues. Uh, and we've been around since 1989, but I did want to share with Carla that, or rather Tiffany, that we have a very interesting project called Dance the Vote, which is about uh, commissioning um, choreographers and spoken word artists to create short pieces about the urgency and history of voting, which we pair with voter registration. That's a sidebar. What we're working on right now around um, gun sense advocacy is the way we describe it is uh, we are partnering with, um, with um, Painting for Ferguson, Painting for Peace in Ferguson and Moms Demand Action. Painting for Peace in Ferguson is an initiative. Uh, it's a book that was actually developed out of the panels that were made when Mike Brown was killed and there was a lot of um, looting and, and stores you know, were, were vandalized and there was a lot of understandable upset in the community. And so the, the, there was a lot of boarding up of windows and artists went and, and painted for peace, local artists. And so we are working with them. We are producing a student production of 26 Pebbles. I don't know if you all are familiar with that. It's a new, relatively new play by Eric Ulolo, and it's uh, based on over 60 interviews that he did about six months after the, the um, shootings at Sandy Hook. And it, it has a kind of, it, it, the style of it in a, in a sense is, is relates to the Laramie Project. But what's interesting for me is that we're doing it in communities of faith and libraries and free spaces to try and reach out to um, non-traditional audiences and we are including conversations with moms demand action 
so that people really understand that there are very specific things they can do, including push, pushing back about having a legislation in Missouri to have guns in daycare centers and in schools. The, the Missouri legislature has been trying to make that possible. We've been pushing back. So I, I'll stop for now because I have to say my access is good. Thank mm -hmm. you. And to say that my pronouns are she, her, hers. Excellent. Sarah, are you still on the call with us? I am. Brilliant. While you're talking, I'm going to try and share my screen. Okay. So please introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Sarah Trail. Um, I'm a 23-year-old recent Harvard graduate um, that works in custody in, in jails and prisons in the Bay Area teaching inmates how to get their high school diploma. Um, I've been sewing since I was four, and um, I've had a lot of personal success kind of due to my middle class background and two parents who would be able to support everything but I have a fabric line I have a pattern collection I have written a book with CNT publishing that's like in Barnes Noble and Joann's um really teaching young kids how to sew but once I went to undergrad I went to UC Berkeley go bears um I, I really kind of was awoken to systemic injustice and I had an experience and opportunity to teach in public schools um Coming from private schools, I kind of saw firsthand the inequities between private and public school. So I became like, you know, sewing instead of teaching kids how to sew and make prom dresses and tote bags. I kind of shifted my focus to making political art quilts just to talk about inequities in education, inequities in school. Um, and so since then, um, I've, I founded the SJSA, which is literally a nonprofit that teaches kids how to sew and make art quilts. And I just bring in volunteers. We kind of bridge an intergenerational community of volunteers who are willing to help and mentor and train up, you know, youth how to be engaged or civically engaged artists as they're like challenged to tackle social issues in their community that really affect their lives. Um, a unique part of SGSA is that we intentionally bridge generational, racial, and socioeconomic divides by having youth art embroidered by volunteers across the U.S. So we have two types of programming. We have long-term programming, which we'll have at the San Jose Quilt Museum, where we'll have the same kids every day, and they'll make their own quilt from start to finish. And then we also have workshops as programming, where if you have an already existing group of people that you want to, um, you know, have a workshop with, we bring in the kids, and we bring in art and material and fabric and everything, and we make quilt blocks and then the quilt blocks get sent out across the world to embroidery volunteers and then they get sent back to us and we put it into a community quilt that showcases issues from police brutality to gun violence to sex trafficking to cat calling so it's really about youth voice through textile art more than it is about sewing but you know it's it's really just an opportunity to share marginalized voices in a in a venue that isn't typically listening to them Yes. All right, thank you. Yeah. Um, I I know that I couldn't see what I was sharing, but I think everybody else could. Was did that feel successful? Yes. yes. Yay, Sarah! I was literally <laughs> just going to the beautiful website and sharing some images from there. Um, Sounds good. Now, um, uh, is Take Back Our Street still on the call? Oh, cool. we'd love to hear from you. Unmute yourself. We'd love to meet you. <laughs> How's it going? Uh, I'm one of the uh, executive directors at Take Back Our Streets. I'm Julius. Uh, this is my co-executive director. I'm Caesar. Um, what we do at, uh, well, we're from Oakland. Um, Take Back Our Streets started um, when our brother was murdered in Oakland. And uh, from there, we we started to reach out to all of the uh, different community members to um, kind of ignite the fire to further the fight to stop violence, gun violence, intercommunal violence. Um, Recently, we've kind of woken up and like, what have we gotten ourselves into? Because it's turned into a full-blown organization. Um, he's the he's the 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 mental health staff in 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 the the HR department for all of our mental health staff, um, the licensed clinicians that we have, and I'm kind of like the the uh, the field officer, I guess you could say. So I'm in the streets a lot. Um, we deal a lot with trauma, um, intercommunal violence, trauma, domestic violence human trafficking, uh, police trauma, whatever the trauma is um, from a mental health standpoint. And then uh, event, when it comes down to events and different things like that, we kind of step to the streets and kind of see what they want to see and see what they want to do. 
and uh, we just put a, a plan behind it and incorporate them as much as we possibly can. And since then, we've just been rolling on. Wow. You pretty much summed it up. But uh, uh, me and my, uh, not my nine to five, I work for a council service. We are uh, with a reentry treatment team. So we deal with social justice and I'm working with probation and parole officers every day and advocating for the people that we work in in between and helping them re, you know, reenter and navigate through society and, you know, stay home and stay free. And then on the other hand, I'm advocating with them in the county in the meetings, telling them that the program, the RFP has got to be right because you got to give people a second chance. Like if they mess up one time, you can't just be ready to throw them back in the clink. You know what I'm saying? So it, it, it's a lot, it's a lot. It comes with, it comes with a lot, a lot of effort and a lot of lived experience knowing what's going on. Uh, me personally, I got shot 11 times by an Oakland police officer. And uh, yeah, uh, so, you know, I hate the police, period. I don't want to do, I don't want no dealings with the police at all. So we take a first hands-on pro approach to getting the mud by uh, ourself. You know what I'm saying? Without only time, we you're going to see one of us call 911 or anybody connected to us if somebody need an ambulance or a supplier, period. Um, we try to reduce harm and the trauma from, you know, any interactions with the police because in every situation I've been in, they cause more harm than they do protection. Uh, right now, we're trying to link up with some lawyers and some people, not necessarily politicians, people that can write legislation and allow us to push it at the forefront. You know, I, uh, I got a lot of lived experience with the justice system, with trauma, with the streets. So, like, a lot of people know me out here where I'm from, so when they see the work that we doing, they like, okay, well, it's a turnaround. It's like a whole 360. So they willing to step out and try to make it, uh, try to make it even better too. play what part they can. So, you know, it's like the more the merrier. That's how I see it. So if we, if we can make it go turn up and get hot worldwide to where everybody is on the same page, I'm all in for it. And whatever I can do, you know, to provide knowledge, service, whatever to make it, to play my part in the machine and make sure it works. That's what I'm with. Period. Thank you. Um, I'm also realizing that we've mentioned the Every 28 Hours plays a number of times, um, but I never did an actual description of what that project was. So I will do that very quickly. Um, so uh, I'm the, um, the producer of the Every 28 Hours plays, uh, which were um, commissioned um, and developed in collaboration with the Oregon Shakespeare Festival and the One Minute Play Festival and so many theaters um, from all over the country. Um, some theaters provided playwrights. Um, playwrights uh, provided materials uh, uh, as well. Um, everyone wrote for free. We all traveled to Ferguson, workshop the plays. There's about 75 in the full collection. And, um, and there have been engagements with these plays all over the country. And the idea is to create a something for people to react to and to react with. Um, and I feel like that um, has some resonance with natural shocks and the work that Lauren's been doing. Um, I'm also really moved by the number of people who are not only on this digital discussion right now, but the number of people who wanted to join us and were unable to due to scheduling conflicts. Um, I really do feel like these uh, ways of connecting digitally are also ways for us to uh, collaborate asynchronously. It allows us to take the work that we're doing individually and, uh, and have more exponential impact by being able to collaborate nationally. Uh, I'm also really moved by the diversity of voices and people who are on this call. I feel like that's the only way to respond to a national epidemic. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that some of us are coming from a very specific um, uh, activist space that's about race. And I know that for myself, that's definitely one of the places that I am strongly uh, um, opera. But we also have folks who are working from the larger scope of gun violence um, in the United States. We've got several directors who worked on um, uh, the After Orlando which is another place where if you're already part of a marginalized community, chances are gun violence is going to affect you uh, more harshly. 
Um, so I would love to um, um, ask some people and feel free to just unmute yourself and start talking and we'll see if that works in terms of managing our conversation. That feels too wild and crazy. We can start using the chat function, but please feel free to just to respond to this prompt. Um, what is the problem that you are trying to solve? What is the main challenge that you're trying to um, address in your work right now? Uh, I guess we'll start. Um, I think um, for, for, for starters, I think the main thing that we have to realize um, is that not guns don't kill people. People kill people. And you can use, you know, people use knives, people use, you know, yada, 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 you know, whatever the weapon of choice is. But um, I, 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 I do agree with small little pieces of gun control, but um, it starts to dip into different types of things that, that, that are needed in conversation as well. Um, you know, mainly freedom, you know, it's, it's, it's okay for people who don't look like inner city people or blacks to have arsenals full of, you know, AR-15s and what have you and different things like that, but it's illegal or it's a threat when somebody who's not allowed to or not expected to have one of those things in their possession. So gun control, I do agree with some pieces of it. Um, I think the, uh, the psychological piece has to uh, improve a lot since um, a lot of them you know, that's the, the ticket that that's used to um, to kind of free some of those that use these weapons to um, to perform mass shootings. Um, but beyond that, uh, I think I think I think um, we need to realize that guns don't kill people. People kill people. Um, for me, uh, one of the biggest challenges that I'm facing in the work that we doing is a uh, having the people understand that us being unified is in so high demand right now and we need to focus on that above everything like i'm gonna just use us as a, in a scenario like this is my brother but i don't see my brother face to face all the time you understand what i'm saying or I see my brother in passing or my sister in passing and won't speak but a mug of or you understand what I'm saying? Those 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 type of problems right there are are little, but they're strong in bringing people together. Cause if we can't even come together to communicate, how can we get come together to fix the problems that needs us to get to where we need to go? That and uh having people understand that we need to come out this love and hip hop generation and really make you know, instead of sitting on the sitting on the uh, computer or, or typing a like, get out there and really vote and rock that vote it, where you at and, and and make some changes and vote for some people who gonna really make some difference. If not, then all the coming together in the meetings are just prices. If we're not gonna do the things that's gonna put us in position to really make the power plays that we need for social justice, for prison reform, for real gun control. And I'm not talking about taking them away because I believe in the second amendment. I'm all for firearms. I'm just not for crazy motherfuckers with fire. Excuse my language. <laughs> Period. That's, that's my biggest problem right now. Yeah. And these police. Thank you. I really appreciate your perspective. I also want to make sure everybody, you have room to disagree if you want. So I'm going to state my one place of disagreement, which is guns do kill people. People kill people with guns, but guns kill people. They're killing machines. Um, I recognize that uh, we live in the United States and people should have access, but in our country, folks have way more guns than in other places. Um, so I feel like that's a pretty vital part of the conversation too. So I am agreeing with almost every single thing you just said, but I feel like guns kill people, but we should keep talking about this. Who else wants to tap in? So I want to say, uh uh, Julius and Caesar, my name is Vidu, it's V-I-D-H-U, uh, and, um, you know, I think I, what I heard from what you said is one, one is the importance of relationship and community. Uh, Julius, that's what you said. Uh, and, and also you said, um, people kill people, not guns kill people. 
Um, and I'm, I'm really hearing all, you know, the huge amount of work you're doing. And I really want to acknowledge that work. It's, it's really powerful and important work. Um, and um, like Claudia, actually, I, I, I'm not into guns because I think the United States is crazy when it comes to guns. Uh, I, I'm, I'm an immigrant. Uh, I've also traveled a lot and lived in other parts of the world. I grew up in India and uh, the epidemic of mass shootings in the United States we're, is we're still, here. We're, still here. we're still here, just give us, we're, we're still here. We, we're, we're still working. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I mean, to me, to me, it's, uh, it's horrific that children in the U.S. have to go through drills and deal with gun safety. Uh, to me, it's horrific that communities of color deal with so much violence and police brutality. And uh, I mean, I could go on and on. And frankly, as you know, a member of this society and also as an artist, I feel helpless a lot of the time. And the reason that I engaged in these plays was uh, from that desire to make that small drop of difference, uh, uh, you know, and, uh, and uh, I think like Tiffany here, I, we both worked on the After Orlando plays in uh, 2016. Uh, so I was really appreciative that we could we could do small and I could do small impactful evenings of theater uh, uh, that engaged the community and brought in community organizations. So we 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 um yeah and to 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 go back to your point um relationship and community yeah the strengthening uh, when we I think when I think when everybody realizes um the importance of relationship and community. Um, and I'll first, I'll, I'll backtrack and say this, whenever the big boom or whatever's gonna happen to America, whenever it happens, it's gonna happen to everybody. You know what I mean? So um, that's why me, my, myself, I never understood, um, I never understood racism. Um, I never understood uh, the, 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 the motive behind gentrification and different things like that. Me personally, mm -hmm. It would, it's desirable. It, it would be a lovely thing if we could all live in harmony. But, but unfortunately, the powers that be have made that to where that's not the case. So mm -hmm. the strengthening in, in, in the community that we need, it has to come from us within. So we see people like um, the Honorable Louis Farrakhan saying that we need to separate and different things like that, which leans me more towards agreeing with him because after trying for so many years, after trying for so much time, after trying for, you know, whatever we had to do to try and unify and, if you will, abide by the rules that were, you know, given to us, not necessarily, you know, not dating back way back, but just like modern day stuff. It's like they've made it throughout in Oakland. Now the whole downtown has been washed of everything that's colorful. It's, it's, it's nothing but 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 whites and i'm not saying that's a problem but why can't we be included so mm -hmm. there needs to be some strengthening community and there needs to be some strengthening in the in the in the arena where you know the 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 cohesive part of coexisting you know resides mm -hmm. let, let me just interject on that because it, it, for me in oakland i'm not speaking for nowhere else around the world right now i'm just speaking specifically to Oakland and what's going on. Cause I don't know everything that's going on specifically in every place. I just know about what I'm, I'm talking specifically to Oakland. I have a problem with Oakland being full of white people because in the beginning of the history of this city, it was a Ku Klux Klan city. It was a Ku Klux Klan city. And then this city became a chocolate city during, through Huey P. Newton and the Black Panthers and the cultural and industrial revolution. Everyone moved right here. We had laws and a lot of our people owned property and then they came with all these mortgage and fixed rates and a lot of these predatory lending schemes and a whole bunch of stuff where people didn't understand all they seen is money times because inflation and things that was going on. These were tactics that were set, that were set up before they were even talking about integration. You know what I'm saying? This is generations and generations of stuff that's been set up to hold us back. 
and I have a problem with it. Then when we got elected officials that let to sell parts of the city out to Uber and these financial institutions, but my city looks like Skid Row on every side. That's a problem to me. Mm-hmm. We got 7,000 vacant spaces in the city to fill people with a city of 35 and 100 plus growing homeless brothers and sisters. You see what I'm saying? And that number grows by the hundreds daily. Steady, steadily building above market rate housing with no percentage of it affordable or assistable or come on, man. But we stay in the most expensive place in the country because we got Google and Apple here. I don't understand it, but you give Ford 40, even 50 million, uh, $40,000 to let them put these bikes all over the city. And then you have the city wasting resources with people calling to make it white people, gentrifying white people, making racist, demeaning, threatening phone calls, putting people life at risk for nothing. I have a problem with that because on the flip side, you got these racist skinhead ass police coming in here, running to the call of whoever calling that's white and they lying half the time. That's why you got to be recording everything that's going on. It's not a game to be played out here. I've been shot 11 times by the police for dead for 18 minutes. I know what it's like. So I have no sympathy and no sympathy. Yes, I want my gun. Oakland police out here murder people like a gang. Police yeah, everywhere I murder people. Mm-hmm. I want mine here personally. Certain things I'm just not going to have. I understand though. It's a problem. It's a problem. And for my white brothers and sisters, I don't believe in like allies. Either we're going to be brothers and sisters or we're going to be family. You're not an ally because at the end, the ally at the end of the day, he'll turn on you too. You see what I'm saying? Either we're going to be brothers and sisters, because I, I know good white people. Like, I really mess with them. But then at the flip side, these are the same white people. When we get jacked by the police together, they like, oh, hell no, it's not going down like this. Versus some people who say they cool, some of the liberals that say they cool, and they get out there and protest you with Black Lives Matter signs in their gate, but then vote for Nancy O'Malley, who've been locking up and oppressing our people for two decades. Oh. Crimes they didn't commit, but you will vote for her? You're not my friend. Get away from me. Let's keep it real. Mm. So this is Claudia. I'm interjecting. Thank you so much. I appreciate so many of the things you just said. Uh, and I definitely feel like, again, I'm just going to repeat the point I made, which is marginalized communities are affected by gun violence um, way more in the United States. Mm-hmm. Um, the issues you're working to solve, ultimately, I feel like they're all tied to the ultimate sin of white supremacy in our country. But it's also tied to male supremacy. Um, you know, we've got a lot of women on this call. And, uh, and I'm in a lot of justice spaces around the country. And I find that they are full of women. I was at the uh, Wear Orange March here in the Bay Area. Uh, and it was a lot of mothers and grandmothers. And yeah, sometimes they had their husbands with them. But I realized this is, this is a movement that's powered by women to a certain extent. Um, and a lot of the reading I've been doing uh, has been talking about how a lot of this violence um, it's racial violence, but it's also gendered violence, where uh, a lot of these mass shootings um, have co- some component of gendered violence, violence towards women involved in them. Um, I'm seeing a couple of nods. Is that resonating with anyone uh, on the call yes. as well? Mm-hmm. Yes, I, I think that I was, in fact, was I was telling someone, I, I'm Susie Butler, I was watching a show one night, and this guy was talking about women, femme, Nazi, women are just I'm like, what in the heck is going on? And they're always trying to put men down and they're always trying to get rid of men and we should kill all of them. I'm like, okay, these men really hate women. They hate women. Okay, Mm -hmm. so yes, I believe that. It is about killing as many women as possible. So why would, you know, that's the only reason I think they're doing it. So I I actually wanted to interject and say that, Susie, welcome. I'm so happy on the call. Uh, you want to introduce yourself briefly, and uh, maybe if you just move back a little, we can uh, see you better. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm Susie Butler, singer and actress uh, around the Bay Area um, for many years. But I, um, in fact, I had a tragedy. My grandson was murdered, and nobody seemed to know who did it. So there's... Um, some type of code between, I know you guys talking about all this stuff, but there's also a code between you guys uh, that don't tell when something happened. And also for the the mothers, I also feel 
You know what your badass kids are doing. Sorry, no cursing. But you know what your kids are doing. You know who have a gun in your house. So why in the world are you even, you know, allowing your kids to do this type of stuff? It's like you don't care as long as they bring home some money, bring home some food. I don't know. What's going on? Can I interject? Yes. Okay. Um, speaking, speaking, speaking from a uh, lived experience, um, I wasn't uh, a street, you know, a cat myself, but um, I have seen and lived in situations where the majority of the kids in my house had to, you know, kind of eat out of the same pot. So, you know, it's two, three packs of top ramen and, and, and four kids have to eat, you know, so it's, it's, it's it's an emotional toll that it takes on a child to see his parents live like that and then you know there's it's 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 they got different straps on them different clamps and different things like that and then i think what it is for the kids is they don't have anything else to occupy their minds and i say that because nowadays especially in schools high schools middle schools um they've taken um the ability to for kids to work with their hands out of the school. Yes. You know, and what sucks about that, and that's that's resemblance, that's resemblance of you know being in chains. You know, you can't work with your hands, you know. Right. So um a lot of alternatives, things to do with their hands have been taken away from them. And then what do you give them? Guns. Again. You know, and the whole part about it is when you look at statistics, and this is things that we've all researched, that uh the the number of 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 home invasions was up in our cities you know, Oakland, San Leandro, different places like that. So then we found out where all of these snub nose 38, you know, we found out where all these things were coming from. These old people are leaving these guns and different things and these lock boxes. And these kids are home and in- doing home invasions, 15, Burglary. 16 burglaries, and they're coming out with these guns. Now, whatever else they're getting a hold of from the time they get the gun and the time they commit the murder, who knows, you know, right. and that's the tough part about it, because reaching these kids in between that time can mean risking your own life. I can't tell you how many guns I've had pulled on me recently, just walking in my own neighborhood, you know, trying to speak to somebody. And that has to be a risk that you have to be willing to take. Yeah. And me as a father and, and me as 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 a, as a African-American, black, whatever you call it, as a man, you know, I have to be willing to lay down my life so that another kid can live theirs. Oh. Um, uh, I, so I saw that uh, Tiffany wanted to share something, and uh, and I don't know if Susie's still on the call, but Susie is actually a principal at a school, and she might be able to talk a little bit about um, uh, the 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 impetus behind um, giving people something to do with their hands, literally sewing, um, or Kathy might also be able to reflect on that. But I wanted to give Tiffany a chance to tap into the conversation. Oh, thank you. I um, I just wanted to say uh, this is all. It's all so important. This discussion is so important, and it's and um, I think that what I had wanted to just mention was that for me, with Protest Place Project, one of the questions, one of our central questions, is how do we get people to talk? How do we get somebody who, you know, when we think about the people who are probably listening to this conversation today on HowlRound, they're probably people who are interested in the arts, interested in gun control, and so we're talking to people who who can probably participate and contribute to the conversation. But how do we reach the people who are not having this conversation with us? How do we reach the people who are on the opposite side? And that's and that's something that that as an artist, because I'm a playwright and I'm a professor, and um, and that's just a central question to me in my work and what we're trying to do at Protest Plays. And how how do we have those conversations? Because um, as as Julius and, and Derek are saying, that's absolutely right. That your conversation that you're having within your community is different than the one that the opposition or the you know political opposition or the gun control opposition or whatever it is that you're working towards it's very different the conversation they were having and we've been living down in the south for the last two years we're in arkansas my husband had a position there and um it was wildly different than anything i'd experienced before i'd never lived in the south it was a town of thirteen thousand people so it was a very very small town in the south and and there were a lot of things where it was like at the end of the day we all want the same thing we all want to live in peace and be happy right. and take mm-hmm. care of our family we all want the same thing but we can't agree on how to get there and and i'm just really curious and really hopeful with everything that that we've been doing and the playwrights that we've been working with and the organizations we've been working with that there is a way and, and i love the quilts and and all of this like art for activism 
how does it translate into action? How do we build the community of artists that is able to access the community that perhaps doesn't attend the arts? How do we activate them? How do we get them engaged? How do we have conversations so that we're not just arguing all the time? Um, and I, I just I, I was just saying that that was that's a central question for me and something that I spend a lot of time thinking about and I really find valuable listening to what everybody else is doing and and the steps you're taking to to have those conversations because nothing's going to change if we don't start making difference and we have this this administration right now that is leading with hate and stoking the fires of hate and stoking the fires of fear and not leading by example in any way shape or form how to come together and and so it's up to people like us it's up to organizations it's up to communities to overcome that and not fall prey to more of that and and I I don't know if it's going to work but I'm hopeful um, but that's one of the questions that I really wrestle with is how do we bridge those gaps and how do we how do we make our art efficacious in a way that leads to the change we want to see okay I, I'd love to talk um, um, All right, Kathy and then Joan please okay Claudia was just showing images of some of our panels and you know, just what you've been saying and what the Take Back Our Streets people were saying about put something in your hands, both Sarah Trail and the Sewing Academy and Vision Quilt are literally asking people of all backgrounds, of all kinds of economic and, and racial backgrounds to really share their visions. And our goal is to train teenagers to work with other teenagers, to have them on teams with survivors and community activists to have these conversations using art and the power of it to really get people to look. And as I said, these panels are permanent and they, they don't go away. So when you see what a gun owner has said, and when you see um, someone from San Quentin, I, I can put up, how do I, I don't know how I share my screen, but I can put up, uh, how do I, I don't know how to do that. I won't do it right now. Go ahead, Claudia, how do I do that? It's the green button at the bottom of your screen. Right. Then share screen. <laughs> All right, and then I go to my little thing that I'm ready for. Oh dear. Um, so we we've had men in San Quentin make panels. Um, here's one of them, and he, this man talked about perhaps if if guns had been locked up when he was young, he wouldn't be serving 21 years in San Quentin. Um, so that's the kind of conversation. So when I show, oh dear, it's not there. When I, when I show his panel to people in Chicago or in Oakland, you know, they, they want, they want to be able to think about things on a whole nother level. Um, this one was done by a eighth grader in, in Oakland. And he, he said, who killed our hope? I mean, that's a pretty profound question. Um, and other, other people, this is from a girl in Hayward. Oh, sorry, Photoshop. Um, and it just goes on and on. This is done by a woman who works for Every Town for Gun Safety. Her only son was killed in the mission to a random bullet. Um, and this is, this is from, uh, a kid in Chicago, this is from a young girl, this is how she sees her city. So you can't see these panels and you can't read their artist statements without wanting to do something. And that's, that's our whole point. So I'll show you just a tiny bit of our model and I'd love to connect with all of you um, because this is, this is exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to engage people in panel making and in group dialogue, host exhibitions um, and create community you know, connections with people like yourselves and host community conversations and say, what can we do in the next six months in this neighborhood, in this community? Thank you. Thank you. And then you just hit the button that says stop sharing and it'll go <laughs> back to our face. Thank you so much, Kathy. That was great. Um, uh, and I don't, I, again, uh, uh, Sarah is busy principaling 
at the school, so I'm not sure if she's still on the call with us. Um, but one of the really powerful exercises she did was um, uh, she's she's part of some cohort that's getting some support, and um, we had a meeting where we not only she talked to us about her process, she shared with us panels that had been made by people from all over, but then she actively asked us to spend two hours making our own anti-gun violence quilt panels. Um, which was a very powerful exercise. I find that you activate a different part of your brain when you're not only absorbing art, but when you're also making the art. Um, Joan, Joan, yeah. you still on the call? Well, Please. And I, and I just want to say that Vision Quilt and Sarah of the Sewing Academy, we are partnering. So we are now a young and old person and <laughs> dynamite partnership. So we're very excited about that. Go ahead, Joan. Um, mm -hmm. This is wonderful, and I, I just want to say that to, to, to our friends and our colleagues from Take Back Our Streets in Oakland, I was listening really deeply to you, and um, you know, it, it hurts to hear the things that you're saying. Growing up on the south side of Chicago and being intimately involved in St. Louis and Ferguson, these problems are systemic, and um, I appreciate the um, the honesty. When somebody is honest and they're authentic, there is no greater gift when somebody tells you what their truth is. And so I appreciate, I just want to say, I, I hear you. It hurts to hear the things you're saying. Uh, but I, I, I think what you're saying is very important and, and that we share it in a public way. I want to take a moment and be what it feels to me um, I'm, a, I'm an artist, I'm also a social activist, and I'm also, I feel like a realist. And the fact is, is that this is a racist, misogynist, violent culture. We, this country is based on violence. And uh, we can, all of us, work to undo racism and misogyny. Nobody is, is going to take away, the NRA and the culture of this country is never going to let us take guns away altogether. I wish they would. I agree with Claudia that guns also kill people. Um, I don't want to be near a gun, but I am aware that we have to figure out a way to bridge the conversation with people who want their guns. Because if we can't do that, we are really stalled. And so I want to share with you just a couple of strategies that we've been looking at, if that's okay. I've been in conversation with the Interfaith Partnership, which is a coalition of over 40 different religious groups, um, really across the spectrum. And one of the things that, that one of the leaders there has said to me is, it's a really big tent, and we want a real a big tent that can contain everybody. We are not going to agree on what our strategy should be exactly uh, to prevent gun violence, but we are possibly going to agree that this is a moral and ethical and public health issue. And if we can do that, then we can begin to talk about gun sense advocacy, which is not the same thing as anti-gun. I personally, Joan, am anti-gun. That's gonna put me in a bubble way off by myself. So what I chose to do when I said I was going to produce 26 pebbles, which is this beautiful play about the shooting of 21st, first graders at Sandy Hook and six educators working with the student group. Um, what I said is we're not going to try and go into traditional theater spaces because they're expensive and they're difficult to book, except if you do something way, way in advance. And they also tend to, to attract the same kinds of people. We want to go into different spaces where we can begin to develop different relationships. So what we decided to do was to partner with all these communities of faith and also with libraries and to make this a free production so that cost was not an impediment to anything and to also have the Moms Demand Action as part of our involvement who can offer strategies. And the strategy, the two things that I personally am focused on as an activist as well as an artist is trying to block the state legislature not just in Missouri, but around the country from making guns. We, we know that we need gun safety. We need protections. 
we need to have more stringent laws about waiting periods and about who has access and where guns can be carried. They, they do not belong in schools. They do not belong in childcare centers. They do not belong in certain public spaces. We can push back up against the legislature to insist that we have this form of protection. There are 4 million members of Moms Demand Action, and they're not all women. But you're right, Claudia. It's very interesting that this is kind of something that a lot of women have taken on. And I think in part it has to do with our dealing with some aspects of what I might call toxic white masculinity, because the mass shootings have been by white men. And that has to be said. They're not being done by men of color, really. They're being, and they're not being done by women. So a lot of women have come together, but we welcome our men, our men, our allies, our male allies, because we all need to come together. So we want to push back against the legislatures. And one way we can do that is that we go to the state capitol, that we have these meetings, and that we really have a very viable physical presence. But the other thing is that we have got to get the vote out. Because unless we flip the Senate and the House of Representatives in November 2018, we are going to be dealing with more conservative judges that block all of our actions. And this is, this is so crucial. It's not as interesting as putting on a play, you know, getting out the vote. But as Tiffany said, and as hopefully we are doing with our Getting Out the Vote project, we can find ways, because we're artists, to make it creative and to give us agency. But I think for me, I want the performance to be tied to action. I want always to try and follow it up with a deep, authentic conversation. I want somebody who wants their gun to be able to say, you can't take my gun away from me, I want my gun. And then for me to be able to say, and you get to have your gun, can we agree that that gun should not be in a daycare center? We have to figure out how we have these conversations my friends, or I think we're really, we're really in trouble. And we also have to really support our young people. They are leading the way, which is why we're doing a student production. Mm -hmm. I'm passionate. I'm sorry to go on and on, but I, I, you know, as much as I talk about it, I get so emotional when I think about what goes on and the fact that over 90 people a day are killed <clears throat> through the use of guns. And so much of it is uh, our people of color. So, and children, young people. Um, I wanted to try to include uh, Claudia and Stephanie a little bit uh, because I haven't heard you speak for a while. Uh, and also I wanted to mention uh, that Carla and Susie and I had worked together on an, an event at Brava Theater which included the every 28 hours plays. And, um, um, and, to, and to echo what you said, Jane, actually, uh, our event was followed by a pretty deep, authentic conversation. And it seemed the audience, people was really hungry for conversation and didn't leave for a long time. Uh, I, I'll let you jump in uh, and add to that if you want, perhaps Carla and Susie and Stephanie. Yeah. yeah, so a big thing for me with every 20 hours because, you know, I, I live this life. Like, these are my people that are dying. Um, so it's, I, I feel particularly attached to something like that. How do I use my privilege of being at a very large institution like ACT and really elevate others to have their voices heard that we do not often hear through different narratives. Um, so after the Every 20 Hour Plays, when we produced, I think we probably did about 30 of them, um, I made it a point, a very strict point here that I wanted these conversations segregated. And I had a lot of resistance from a lot of folks saying, we all need to talk together which is great, but I'm going to be honest with you. Me, being a woman of color, I have been trained from society to censor myself on how I'm feeling around people that do not look like me, who do not. Right. Yeah. Hmm. All right, my video has frozen. 
Is that mm-hmm. true for everyone else? Yeah, I thought Stephanie um, from in a moment of mid-sentence passion. Yeah. Um, all right. Is she there? Uh, I think Stephanie is frozen, but everyone else is fine at the moment. Excellent. Well, we have another uh, we have another half an hour for this conversation. Um, you know, I, I continue to be struck by the intersection of all of these issues because um, and I actually should speak with a little more clarity. Right. Because uh, I, I had a reaction to guns don't kill people. People kill people, which is totally true. Um, but I do think guns make it easier to kill people. Um, they make that a lot easier to do. So ultimately, we do need to fix our society. We need to fix all these issues that are helping to create the um, uh, uh, the opportunities for violence to take place. But I also go, we need to literally have less guns. I grew up in Montana. We all had guns. I grew up. I learned how to use a gun the right way when I was when I was young, um, and that was an amazing experience because I recognized not everybody gets that. Not everybody gets taken out into the backyard and taught this is a killing machine. This is how you kill things with it. Understand that if you pick this up and point it at something, you better be willing to kill it. That's the point of this machine. Um, so that's my own very specific context. Um, I'm super struck by, even in a conversation full of people who are all on the same page in terms of we, we recognize we've got a national ep- epidemic. We are all doing things to address this epidemic. And yet, even in this conversation, it, there are places where we don't totally agree, where there are places where there's frisian. Um, you know, we've talked about gender violence. We've talked about racial violence. And I also just want to make sure we don't lose um, uh, heterosexism and violence to our LGBTQ um, uh, population. There's a reason why After Orlando is another project that many of us have collaborated on and uh, either produced or acted in or directed. Um, and, uh, and I also wanna make sure we don't lose the disability piece of this conversation because disabled communities um, are highly affected by gun violence as well. Um, in this last half an hour of our conversation, I would love to start talking about um, the power of artistic uh, collaboration and why that's working for us. Um, if there are any stories of success people have that they'd like to share, that would be awesome. And then also, please say out loud how the people viewing this video can support your work or support this work in general. Because if you go to Lauren Gunderson's page, Natural Shocks, I'll make sure there's a, a link to this. Um, she specifically says, donate to Every Town USA. Donate to um, Moms, I'm forgetting the name of it, but donate to, to that organization. Moms um, Demand Action. Thank you. Uh, so, um, uh, so please feel free to popcorn. I'd love to hear more about um, how we can support what you're trying to make happen in the world. Mm-hmm. And also, if you have any positive stories, please feel free. Uh, Claudia, I, I'm going to interject and say that, S- Stephanie, since you froze in that very passionate moment, do you want to complete that thought? Yeah. I'm and, so, and, and let's yeah. include Carla, mm-hmm. uh, who hasn't spoken, and then we can open it up to your question, Claudia. Yeah, thank you so much, y'all. Sorry about that, like, technical difficulty. I don't know what happened there. Um, I'm not too sure where it cut off. So if you guys can kind of tell me where it stopped, if I can kind of fill you in. You were speaking about the need for segregated conversations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so like I was mentioning, I, I have been taught from society that me being a young black woman that I'm supposed to censor myself, I have to code switch to a certain way to make others feel comfortable, right? So I made it a point to have these conversations and have it be one space specifically for black who individuals that identify as black others uh pocs and then one conversation happening right above our theater with white um white folks and the conversations that were happening i was not involved in the other ones but in the space that i was with all black folks it was so powerful it was there was great ideas and just really supportive conversations and one thing that came up which i was very surprised and very happy it came up is how we need mentorship in order to move forward and to push these conversations. How can me, 
be a person of color, learn from someone else that is actually pushing the same narrative as me. So for instance, I partnered up with uh, Destiny Arch, which is a great social justice program, but they use dance and it's a youth program as well. And the artistic director there, Sarah Crowell, who's a mentor of mine, she actually has been such a big part of my life in that way. Um, yeah, so you can see through that um, every 20 hours right there. So um, I can actually, hey, Claudia, can I pull up some like pictures to show this? Yeah, okay. So I'll pull up some pictures. Um, here we go. Yeah, okay, it's not working. But um, here we go. Okay, great. So uh, with this, as you guys can see, um, I really focus on like black art and black healing, particularly. So this is Destiny Arts right here. This is some of their kids and they did a, such a beautiful piece with uh, poetry talking about how they can use their voices and stuff like that in order to empower others talking about uh, gun issues and sp specifically police brutality. Um, this is Jessica Lorel who sang with us too. Um, this is some of the pieces that we did as well. But um, here, I'm trying to show you guys. This is the Destiny Arts Movement Workshop. And that was really beautiful because there was one individual who actually um, has a really hard time walking and she just got up and she's like, I just felt like I had to move my body. So it was really beautiful to see. But going off of this as well, um, it, when we have these segregated conversations, we actually follow through of how do we keep each other accountable and how do we keep uh, supporting each other through these really tough conversations. And then there was really interesting conversations happening up in the discussion group with all the white people. They were mentioning um, how they feel at times they don't know how to talk about these issues. And a lot of folks were saying that they have a hard time stepping back, you know? So that was really interesting to see um, how do we as individuals and how we identify, whether it is you are part of the LGBT community or if you are a woman, a person of color, all these, how do we actually really impact ourselves to push this narrative that needs there needs to be change, right? And use our platform with that as well. So I just think that was really important to, um, really highlight that sometimes you need to have these segregated conversations because mm -hmm. I'm not going to feel comfortable going into a room with white people and like talking about that. Right. So, um, I think that's been really helpful and I'm still continuing working with folks around the Bay area, specifically, uh, like folks that have actually been impacted by these issues. And that is something I would love if you all, if, um, I actually could, if you guys look on that website, you can probably find my email as well through ACT. If you guys have any organizations that you feel we need to connect with, or if you feel you want to give suggestions about how we can support your organization, I would love, love, love to hear that. Because the conversation shouldn't stop here. We need to keep it going. Like, let's keep this momentum going, you know? So that was really, really impactful for us here at ACT. And that's something we've been struggling to is how do we keep the momentum going? Because it's a cycle, right? We keep going and then we stop. We hear another thing and then we stop again. I'm not stopping, I need to keep going. Like it, it's gonna happen again and again. I don't wanna forget those who have unfortunately passed, but I need I need to keep going, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. So that's what our ancestors wanted. They wanna see you go and keep going. Um, so I, I need all of you here with me so we can really push this great narrative that Claudia has really provided us through the works of art, which is so important because it's healing as well. So <laughs> I want to comment on uh, the young brothers. I don't know if they're still on there, but they were saying that they took all this, uh, maybe it was someone else who said it, but they took all the stuff. So ain't out of the, out of the schools. They took shop out of the schools. They took auto mechanics out of the schools and put it all in community colleges where you had to pay for it. And I think that is very important because I believe that an idle mind is the devil's workshop. So if you have something to occupy your mind, you maybe you won't be in trouble all the time. Maybe there's something else that you can, you know, can direct your energy to. And that would be a, a good thing. It's, it's in California, I think, more so than, because in the South, they have all that stuff. It's not, they didn't take it out of the schools. Because yeah, they, they, do. they yeah. have it all. And what's crazy about it is the fact that, like, like I said, it's resembling of being in chains, you know, not being able to work with your hands. Right. And um, I think once, like, people can, well, I don't want to say people, but our, our generation coming up can uh, understand at some point how valuable it is um, to have the use of your limbs and be able to reach out and touch and this, that, and the third, right. because mm -hmm. these things make you money. I'm a musician, and, and, and I, I don't fight. I'm a musician, and I don't fight. Cause I value my hands. If I can't touch a keyboard, I can't make money, you know, um, picking up a gun, um, and using it for whatever the reason may be, 
Um, I don't, I don't, it's, I don't think it's ever made anybody a whole bunch of money where they, you know, didn't have the stress that came with it, you know? Um, so I think it's very important that we kind of stress how important it is to, um, if, if, and it's, it's, if the, the, the city government and the school systems aren't doing it, I feel it's incumbent upon us as community organizers yeah. and people who have the power to influence and pull from the streets and pull from these different areas to supply that for the people who need it the most. And that is, of course, the underserved communities, the, the, the areas that city gov local and city government intentionally divest in and not invest in. Right. Yeah, you're right. Because I work in a school district. I, I wasn't a principal, but I worked in a school district. And I just observed what was going on in Oakland Unified School District. And I'm like, these poor kids, with the type of leaders that they have, no wonder everything is all screwed up. Yeah. They are not good at all. Not good. So I'd, I'd like to say something. I, I, I want to just support everything that you all are saying. And I want to say, when we put good paint and good brushes in the hands of incarcerated youth at, in Camp Sweeney, which is part of Oakland. These are kids who are given a chance to hopefully not end up in, in a jail jail. Um, they feel like artists. I mean, we are enhancing them. They, and they are feeling that their voice is now going to have a national stage. And I tell them, I'm taking your panels to Chicago. I'm taking them to you know, to San Diego, to LA, and that that lifts them up. And and the same with the kids in Chicago. You know, they're responding to the kids in Oakland, all through these 18 by 24 inch panels. Um, so I want I'm I'm hoping Joan that you'll use some in St. Louis, and I'm excited for the ACT connection. But I want to put out a wild idea to all of you. We know that the NE, that the NRA is running this country. And I have met so many people who are working just alone on gun violence, let alone on racial you know, equality. Why cannot we join ourselves and how would we do that and become stronger than the NRA? It's all about connections and we're doing our individual things very well, but how can we really become more powerful than the people who are oppressing all of us? I, I will say, I, I love that idea, but it's also money. <laughs> it is money and resources. <laughs> I mean, that's really what it comes down to. We can unify and unite, and I really, really wish we could, but at the end of the day, if we do not have the money to do this and actually move forward, nothing's gonna happen. We can be a million against one, which it kind of feels like right now, but if we don't have the resources, it's not gonna happen. So Although that's my opinion. This is Claudia. I, 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 I always do this in a conversation where I'm like, I 100% agree with you, but I also disagree just a little bit. I go, yes, yes, yes. But also one of the powerful things we have uh, is our decentralized movements. Um, you are all doing amazing work that has had national impact. Um, Tiffany had an idea and posted something on Twitter, and suddenly people all over the country were engaging. And they were engaging with tools that she spent a lot of time gathering. She, they were engaging with tools that Carrie and Dad spent a lot of time gathering. So I go, oh, we need to find ways to um, stay true to the work that we are doing, keep doing that, but also find ways to share that work, make it more accessible to others so they can amplify, connect. Um, so I'm not saying no to anything anyone just said, but I am saying um, I... I I, I think there's more hope um, in what we are doing right now, actually. I, I feel hopeful. Um, no, please, go right ahead. Oh, sorry. Just because you had asked earlier, too, about um, successes and steps forward. Oh, Finn woke up, so sorry. Um, is that... Um, uh, you know, one of the two of the two of the initiatives that we started are are ongoing, and the one that we're focused on right now is the Get Out the Vote plays. And um, if anybody is interested in those, are one to three minute monologues or plays. They're nonpartisan, and their whole focus is to is to encourage your audience to get out the vote. And they're designed to be done before a production, so at curtain before your before your hey here's our here's our program and here's how you become a member. And oh, here we've got this little one minute, three minute piece that we picked. We have over 20 pieces available, they're royalty free. You can write your own, 
uh, we're just trying to get Peter. I love the dance that um, that Jonah's talking about. That's amazing, and I, I would love to see video of that. So I'm going to be researching. Um, is that is again? We're just trying to to like you said. It's it is decentralized. You can make it your own. But we have power in numbers. So let's all let each other know what we're working on. Um, mm -hmm. And so so the get out the vote plays. We're just trying to get as many people as possible to participate because I think theaters, especially established theaters, get nervous about taking a political stance. Everything's politicized, and we don't want to alienate our members. We don't know. We don't want to lose money, and we don't want to lose funding. And everybody's so paranoid about all of that, and it becomes. Um, you you look at these places that are established, and they are locked in. And <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> And then you look at and you look at um, smaller groups or or theater makers who are working um, independent of of larger institutions, and we have more freedom. We don't have the money, we don't have the resources, like um, like we we're, like were just talking about. Um, but we we have the freedom, we have the mobility. Um, I don't own a theater space, but I can go to the park. I can go talk to the um, bookstore. I can work with a gallery. I can put these in places where my target audience is, because if I'm doing gun plays. I'm not probably just targeting an established theater audience. I want to go talk to the people who um, aren't active, aren't engaged, and maybe have a different opinion than I do. And so I, I agree. I think the decentralization thing is a huge yeah. asset, um, but it is so important and so impactful Bubbles. to be able to come Bubbles. together Bubbles. in conversations Bubbles. like these and gain courage and strength from what other people are doing and then to also connect and say, Eat. how can we work Eat. together? Like, how can we work with Take Back Our Streets? Um, I'm in Iowa right now, I, but but how can I get involved? And what can I learn from you? And how can I support your mission? And those kinds of things. And and the other initiative that we're doing that's been really successful is um, is a, a Heal the Divide initiative, which we, um, uh, six different colleges across the country worked with their playwriting students to write plays about their community. And then we um, exchanged those plays with the other campuses to try and read and share share different communities perspectives um, and this is our first year that we did it and I'm still talking with those faculty and, and getting feedback from them and figuring out how do we how do we make it better how do we make it more open and inviting but again this idea of like how can we use theater to give voice to community so that it's not just all plays coming out of a big city coming from far away but coming from where you live right now what's happening is important to you and how do I get that somewhere where then the community can communicate across zip codes and across geographies so um so i i really appreciate listening to everybody um this week i mean today this week it's we just moved so my brain's a little frazzled. um but i really enjoyed listening and and i feel heartened um by your passion and your dedication everybody that's spoken today so thank you for involving and, and inviting me to participate mm -hmm. can i say something i think kathy said something about uh that you had all these religious groups, why not do it in the churches? I mean, every Sunday there are thousands of churches. Take it to the take it to the people. Yeah. Well, and I want to say that in Oakland next Monday night at the first African uh, Episcopal Methodist Church in downtown Oakland on Telegraph, they are having a panel of religious leaders, and this topic is gods and guns guns and god sorry and um they're doing things for the whole month of june because june is national gun awareness um, month mm -hmm. and their youth group made vision quote panels so they're going to hang them in the sanctuary and and they also are thinking of taking vision quote panels and marking different parts of oakland where homicides have taken place so we want to support that they're going to put them on stakes i mean these are visual representations of tragedies and calls for action. So Claudia asked, what can you do for us? Go to our website, www.visionquilt.org. We have all kinds of things that you can download for free and we will support anything that you wanna do. Um, so yeah, be in contact with us, please. Thank you. Thank you for this wonderful, I'm, I'm gonna catch a plane soon to Oakland. <laughs> so thank you for creating this. Um, so we, we have about five minutes, so we're going to start wrapping up our conversation. Um, Did Carla talk? 
Uh, no, 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 Carly didn't have a chance to talk. So I'm about to hand the mic off to everybody else to say some final observations. Um, I appreciate Carla's awesome listening. And I'm a little disappointed mm -hmm. that we didn't get to hear from her from a participant perspective, as well as um, uh, just hearing if there's any sort of uh, resonance around the environmental issues as well as environmental justice. Um, here's the good news though. This is the first of many digital discussions. This problem is a national problem. It's a worldwide problem, but let's just stick to our country for right now. It's a national issue that we are all working on, and I look forward to us continuing to share um, the places where we have commonalities, the places where we have shared practices, uh, the places where uh, we can support each other, and the places where we need to educate each other. Um, there is a reason why they took away our drums. There is a reason why we were denied the right to read. Um, there is a reason why we were denied access to higher education. When I say we, I'm talking about women. I'm talking about people of color. I'm talking about people from marginalized communities. So this right here, this is us using the drum. This is us um, activating people to use their voice for calls to action just right on. Any final um, observations? I'm going to encourage everybody and let me who possibly close us out. Um, but any final words of encouragement or observation, please feel free. I'm still, I'm still waiting for Carla to speak. Carla. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, I, in this case, as an artist and as a woman, um, I feel like I am gaining so much from listening to you guys. So that's, that was my, my first goal in this conversation. Um, I take so much inspiration in my work um, from hearing you guys work your your butts off. It's amazing to see what you guys have accomplished. And um, I think that for me, the, the, the biggest thing that I worry about in my work now is um, equal access uh, to, to healthy food, because that's something that our communities are seriously lacking. And there's places like Planting Justice and Permaculture Action Network that are trying to draw in people from all over the country and specifically, you know, in Oakland as well, um, to get people to have health, healthier lifestyles so that they can be more active in their community and more clear minded and just also more willing to work together. Because if you're not uh, a healthy, well fed, uh, happy individual, it's gonna be a lot harder to do the work that we're doing in our communities. There's a lot of stress every day. And um, so I'm hoping to bring that more uh, to the forefront. It's, how important environmental justice is alongside social justice. Um, I was thinking that some of us who are in the Bay Area can certainly meet in person um, and, and have a conversation about how to work together. Uh, I've been, you know, directing plays since 1989 and producing plays since 2002, and I'm exhausted. <laughs> And often, I also really want to appreciate Carla, who does set design lighting, and Susie, who's a vocalist and an artist, because often, you know, we jump into projects. Frankly, I do it at the last minute if there's a need for it, uh, and and um, often with very little resources. So, you know, my request is really for partnership and support around doing more of the every 28 hours plays in the Bay Area, because what we did was just the tip of the iceberg. And uh, we need to take this work out to more actual schools and communities, you know. Uh, I also want to say that uh, I feel both despair at what's going on here and in the world, but I also feel it's not, uh, well, I feel a lot of empathy and compassion for everyone and for our group and for other artists and individuals who care so much. And uh, the need for like giving ourselves empathy and each other empathy and like holding each other with kindness because it is exhausting. <laughs> we have a lot to deal with. So I'm just appreciating and thanking everybody for this conversation, yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess I'll go next. Um, I I do appreciate uh, being included on the call. My brother had to step out. Uh, congratulations to him. He just had a baby not too long ago. So, you know, he's 
and his dad thing, and then plus he's still at work. So I think he may be outside if he hasn't driven off. Um, I just want to uh, kind of encourage everybody to uh, whatever it is that you know you're doing, whether it be theater, whether it be um, just action in the streets, or you know being a positive vibe wherever you go. Um, just do whatever you can and take that to the next level. Um, those of us that how many of us are not in Oakland? Okay. Um, okay. Perfect. So, okay. Three. Um, I don't know. I don't know where you guys, um, are individually, but we have this, they, the government, I guess, has this thing called, uh, the black identity extremists. Um, and it sucks because, uh, it kind of put, especially in the Bay area, it kind of puts people up with, with their backs against the walls. Um, because, you know, regardless of the, you know, the, the collaboration, if you look like, if, if we all look like each other, we're all black identity extremists, you know? Um, but, um, we're more, um, to get, we're more, we're more of a, we're more of a force together than we are divided. Um, if anybody's going to be black identity extremists, let us all be black identity extremists, um, fighting for right. Of course. Um, I think we all can, uh, uh agree that, supremacy, racism, and police violence, intercommunal violence, human trafficking, domestic violence. Somehow we got a deportation, all of that. It has, we got to get a handle on it, us as a people. Um, so, you know, I, I encourage everybody to, you know, step up our efforts, myself included, and uh, really push what we do over the top to uh, make our dreams come true. And that's for all of our people to be libera liberated. And we all uh, live in unity, no matter what color you are. Thank you. Great. Because a lot of people that came into this country were considered black when they came here. However, they have now become white. You know, the Irish, the Italians, the Greeks, whoever. They now all of a sudden they're white, which is, you know, then they disconnect from how their grandparents were, were treated. And that's not right. They need to know, remember who they are also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All can right. I a, can I have a closing thought about money? May I? May yes. I say something? <laughs> can I say something about money? My favorite subject. Um, <laughs> yes. I think that we all need to get our hands on some money. And I feel that some of these foundations should be giving us money to do the advocacy and the creative work because <laughs> I'm just thinking, Claudia and I both worked on, we worked on every 28 hours for two years for free, pushing it. I'm thinking about the invisible labor of the work that we do. Same thing with After Orlando, I've produced it three times, invisible labor. I feel like there are these foundations that don't, they want to do good, but they, they play it safe, you know? And so they give it to these big theater companies and maybe the theaters put on a play and the real work is in the community. It's not that I don't love work at a great theater. I mean, I've done work at theaters. I do work at theaters, but I feel that the important work that's being done by so many of the people who are on this call is not being supported and then we burn out. Right, and so I want to think creatively about how we can access resources so that we can really do this work. Because as you know, we're good with, we're able to do things very well with not a lot, but we still need to be given something in order to, to sort of manage our labor. Does this make sense what I'm saying? Yes, yes, yes. Uh -huh. You like this idea? Yeah, I yeah. see everybody nodding their heads. This feels really? like perfect way to close out our conversation i Talk think we should i think we should agree on i think we should agree on our next uh, our, our next live stream to talk about this <laughs> <laughs> i love it um but yes let's end this call with a call to action to the field to the community we need support mm -hmm. to do this work you are yeah, all doing this work yeah. and i'm actually super deeply aware of the sweat equity I see you all investing in this work. The performers yeah. who are on this call, who have been producing, who have been performing for free, for the love, the writers who have donated their words, that are creating actual 
impact in communities that are creating change, this needs support. Um, thank you all so much for joining us for this conversation. Your time is valuable. Um, it is deeply appreciated. Vidhu, thank you for inviting me to have this conversation with you. Um, I feel energized for the continued work, mm -hmm. even as I'm reminded by the um, disappointing necessity for it. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, everyone. Uh, a lot of love to each one of you, a lot of compassion, empathy, and strength and courage for all this beautiful work. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Peace out. Let's have a festival. Let's do a big <laughs> festival. Okay. Indian food. <laughs> Come over. Yeah. I'll cook it. All All right. Right. Bye. Feel free to comment um, on the Facebook event. Drop your links. Mm -hmm. Drop any follow-up questions. Drop uh, places where we can possibly donate funds to continue to support your work. Drop all that information. Um, have a great rest of your day. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Cool. <laughs> this is waving goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>